we're here today to have a conversation about uh, Jeff's new book, A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence. And um, just, just to summarize in the beginning, you know, this book is uh, the story of the discoveries that Jeff and the team have made that led to the Thousand Brains Theory of Intelligence, this theory of how the brain works and how it learns a model of the world. And the book has three parts. The first part describes um, describes the theory in a way that's accessible beyond uh, the, the scientific papers, um, accessible to non-neuroscientists. The second part talks about the theory's impact on AI and why AI is not intelligent. And the third part really looks at the future of humanity through the lens of, of intelligence and brain theory. And in, in the very last part of the book, in Final Thoughts, Jeff has a, a call to action for, for everyone um, who hopefully is curious about how the brain works. And there's a specific call to action for educators. And there's this notion of, of a hope that we will one day incorporate brain theory into what we learn. And I think there's also a notion of incorporating brain theory into how we learn and understanding how we learn. And so what better way to, to have that conversation than to have it here today with um, educators and with students. Um, so to that end, um, let me uh, turn it over to you, Dr. Michael Rindo, to do, give an introduction about yourself and introduce the two students that you have with you today. Sure. So my name is Michael. Uh, I'm the academic dean, the assistant head for academics at Eagle Hill, uh, which means that I spend a lot of time on curriculum development and teacher support and you know, planning how to structure a school uh, and, and the instruction here. Uh, I happen at the moment to be working with the two guys that are with us, Ranger Fair, uh, who is a senior and will graduate in May, and Jacob Shalmi, who's a sophomore both of whom are in a class with me uh, that as Ranger is fond of pointing out, we just made up. And I have to remind him that we just make up all the classes at some point. Uh, this one is called Big Ideas Exploring Narrative Argument. And it's really about how to deal with a, a, an expository text in a way that you can manage. If you're just uh, first wondering whether this is a book that will help me with, with what I'm thinking about or not without spending the time to read word for word through the whole book. And so we do a lot of, uh, of that. We, we've been sort of breezing through books, but we stopped on this one because I got it just about the time we started the class and uh, thought it would make a good connection. So we've spent a little longer on, on uh, A Thousand Brains and uh, they're very interested in this topic. We are obviously as a school as well. Great. And uh, Jacob, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. So I'm Jacob. Um, I'm a sophomore here. This is my first year at this school. Um, I'm from Scarsdale, New York. And um, yeah, I'm very excited about this meeting. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity. So thank you, guys. Great. Thanks, Jacob. And Ranger. Yeah, so I'm Ranger Fair. Um, I'm from Boulder, Colorado. This is also my first year. Um, I'm a senior here. Sadly, only yeah, get one here, year here. But... Yeah, I'm almost pretty excited. Definitely. It's a very interesting topic and a lot to digest with it. Great. Well, um, why don't we start, Michael, if, um, if you would uh, kind of kick things off, because um, I know you um, initially had a conversation with, with Donna um, after reading the book and had some, um, some thoughts and, and observations about it. And so um, I'd love for you to, um, to kick things off by, uh, by sharing some of those initial reactions. <laughs> Sure, we had a, a pretty wide ranging conversation. I think one of the things that is, it might be a good starting place is uh, what we all noticed here is the access that we have to it. And Christy, you sort of alluded to this, that the, the book is very accessible to, to people who are not neuroscientists and that is the three of us. But it means that we're accessing it through the metaphors that explain those concepts in the book. And I mean, I have a couple of, I think really basic questions about that, how much how directly can we rely on those metaphors and thinking through the ideas in a way that helps us know what to make of them in the context of a classroom or education? Where do you think they might break down or need support? And is there a kind of middle ground where we can get a little more without going all the way to the, the peer reviewed papers that you know, the next available step? Wow. Should I start on that? Well, first of all, it's nice to meet you, Jacob. Nice to meet you, Ranger. Nice to meet you, Michael. And uh, it's a pleasure to just talk to you guys about this. So it's, it's kind of a fun thing. Um, 
And that's a very deep question, actually. You're jumping into it's not even particularly relevant, necessarily relevant to this book in specifics. It's it's a question about metaphors in general. Um, and uh, actually, I actually hadn't even thought about that question as deeply as you as you just uh, expressed it. Um, obviously, the, the 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 details of how these the things I describe in the book are, are, are quite challenging technically. If you're even if you are a neuroscientist, <laughs> so I mean, because neuroscientists it's a big field and they don't all share the same language and. Uh, so it, it, you can't make a book that's accessible to anyone and, and use the language that, that neuroscientists use. It's really, really hard to read. Um, I mean, I've been reading neuroscience papers my whole life and I still, you know, I, I, this is true of all neuroscientists. We all have, find them hard to read. Um, so, um, so the use of metaphors is essential in some sense to make something accessible. Uh, and I think uh, you know, as an author, which I don't, not only think of myself as an author, but I wrote a book, so now I'm an author. Uh, it's my second book. Um, you, you, you really have to think hard about the metaphors and, and try to figure out what's a good one um, to use for different concepts. And, um, and some of the metaphors I came up initially myself, um, other people, Donna and my wife and other people, Christy would suggest other metaphors, which are better. Um, and, um, and so that's a, that's a skill in its own right, just coming up with metaphors, right? Uh, now, how I don't know how to answer your question directly. How do I know? How would you know if the metaphor is a good one or not? Well, maybe, maybe I can make it a, a <laughs> tiny bit more concrete. Um, you know, so one of the places that that question arose for us was with thinking about objects and using that word object for both a cup with the Nomenta logo on it and democracy. And then yeah. they're both objects. And yeah. how, you know, you know, maybe there's something more detailed about what's actually happening in the neocortex that would help us see you know, what to that's make. A, got it. Okay, I can talk about that specifically. Um, that's a, and a lot of people have asked that specific question. And, and we use the term object even in our research meetings at Nementa because we don't have a better word for it yet. Um, but I can be more explicit about what it means. I mean, we can think of an object like a physical object. Oh, a coffee cup or a stapler. A bicycle, a car, these are physical objects, no one had trouble with that. Um, but an object in, in this case um, is, is essentially something that has a certain type of structure. Um, I, I talk about in the book, like knowledge isn't just a list of facts. It's not just a list. Um, knowledge is organized in a way, right? So in that, one of the analogies I use is maps, you know, knowledge, map is a model of the world and it's organizing knowledge in, in, a, in a way that it makes it usable. It's not just a list of things. It's structured. And so everything, it turns out that we didn't, we didn't anticipate this when we went into this research, um, that you know, what is the structure of democracy? But we were forced to accept that idea because, um, because of this principle of the neocortex, which is it works the same way on everything. So if, it, if the way the cortex is gonna understand democracy is gonna be the way it understands physical objects. And that was sort of a constraint that we had to live with uh, and we accepted. So then we can say to ourselves, okay, what does it mean to have structure for democracy, right? And so it's, it's, it's a, I'm gonna beat around the bush a little bit here, but essentially it, 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 everything, any kind of object, knowledge about anything is in some sense, a series of facts or observations, if you will, that are arranged in a way um, in, in some sort of physical structure. And the easiest structure to imagine is like a, you know, a grid or three-dimensional grid or latitude and longitude or, the, grid lines on a map. Um, it, the way the neurons do this is really tricky. I don't mind talking about that. Um, but so in that sense, an object is something that you have, you take information, you put it in a structure that is where things have a location relative to each other in some sort of dimensional space, like a space, whether it's a physical space or not. And that the way the brain the accesses information, it moves from point to point on this structure, just like you would move from point to point on a map. You can't jump from one part of town to another part of map. You can, you can go north or south or east or west. Um, and, that, and when you move, you get to the next piece of data. Well, that's how everything is organized in the brain. So the word object refers to just anything that has structure that can be uh, organized this way. And, and um, is that structure imposed? I mean, does the neocortex create a sort of meta knowledge of that structure and impose it on the next new thing? Where, where the edges come from for the object? Well, that's a great question too. These are very deep questions you're jumping right into, Michael. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, a deeper understanding of these things than most people get to. Um, um, we don't know the complete answer to that question. 
uh, the best, I have a pretty good guess about what's going on. Um, and, and then we're gonna get really technical really quickly, if that's okay. Um, so we tend to think about the world like three dimensions, right? You, there's three dimensions of movement in space. Uh, one can think of time as maybe a fourth dimension, but unless we think about things as three dimensional space and, and, and a map is like a two dimensional space, right? It's just two dimensions. Um, the way we think it works in the brain is that uh, the neural tissue enforces a certain set of uh, properties. And the, the way it works is that, imagine the neural, the neural tissue allows you to have maybe a hundred dimensions. Now, I know that's a weird thing. What does a hundred dimensions mean? But you can think of like, uh, I could even use a hundred dimensions on a two dimensional map. I could say there's north and there's east, but I can say there's northeast and I can say there's north, northeast and there's, you know, east northwest whatever yeah i can't do that one but um the point is you could you could have more dimensions they're just not unique and so the brain actually has a whole bunch of these dimensions and it decides based on observation what's the best way to apply it to the thing it's it's thinking about um and i could even go into details about but this gets really technical well um, are, are, are there details that you think i mean the reason we thought about this was that it, it seems like there some amount of detail might be necessary before we can get to some educational implication of what we know. I think, you know, okay, so I think from an educator's point of view, I, I wish I was smarter. So I'm going to rely on you about this. It's not stuff we typically think about. But I think the trick here is um, uh, when we present information to someone as an educator, um, it's rarely useful to present it just as a, a list of facts, right? You try, to, you try to present it in some sort of structure. I gave an example of the book of two different types of structures you might take. I gave the example of a, fact, a, a set of facts about history and you could arrange them on a timeline, which is a one dimensional structure, right? That's a one dimensional space, if you will. You could arrange them on a map and you could say, okay, oh, so you can spend the timeline and say, well, this occurred before that and this occurred after that. And then on a map, you'd arrange them on where they occurred in the world and you'd make different uh, conclusions and inferences and beliefs about the data based on whether you arrange it on a map or arrange it on a timeline. So there's a very simple example of how you can take the same information and perhaps, and if you teach one child um, based on a time-based history and another one you're saying, oh no, we're gonna study the history of Europe and we're gonna study all these results and where things occurred in Europe, um, you can end up with different sort of um, structures in your head. Now, I don't know how, the, what's the right way to do this or maybe do it multiple ways, but all, all I can point out is that how you present the information, how you, you, you have to present it in some way other than just a list. You have to say, here's some structure to it. Um, and that the brain will pick up on that structure, right? That's because that's how it's being presented to you. Um, and so I think at a very, very high level, not a very detailed level, when we think about how we're gonna teach something, we have to think about um, what is the underlying structure which we present it with. You know, is it like, are we going to do like a map? Are we going to do like a timeline? Are we going to do it based on, well, someone's life and so on? And this will change how we think about it. Um, I don't know the right way of doing that. I don't even know the right uh, pedagogical tools to do that. I'm <laughs> just pointing out that you can take the same, how we present it. Um, and I'll, I'll point out one more thing. One of the parts of our theory is that the, um, it's really, the brain really is based on movement. We learn mostly through movement. We, we touch things, we move our eyes, we move our bodies. This is a key to how the whole system works. And so when you're learning something like a new um, physical object, uh, you hold it in your hand and you'll turn it and you'll touch it and you'll pull on it and see what happens. Um, but uh, when it comes to something like democracy, we can't really do that. But there is sort of an equivalence to it. There, it, 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 there is a... Um, um, the brain is, was designed or evolved, I should say, to learn through movement. And now when we're learning things like democracy, we're not really moving, you know, we're not physically moving, but the brain still wants to think of it that way. So sometimes it might be helpful to, to present information in a way that you actually could physically manipulate something. Um, you know, you could place things literally on a map or you could place things literally on a timeline or you could physically somehow you make a structure and rotate it in your head. I don't, I'm on your physical, I don't know the answer to that question, but, but movement helps. Um, and I think this is something people talk about when you teach science that generally, or other certain topics in, in, um, that it's helpful to physically do things uh, physically, um, it helps your brain uh, encapsulate the knowledge better. Um, I don't know if that helps. No, I just have to jump in that um, one of the things that struck me dealing with Eagle Hill is that they did a lot of that quite naturally in the classroom, making things concrete, and that that, that suited the theory well of 
of trying to not make them too conceptual, make them concrete and so you could experience them. Is that fair to say, Michael, that that's been sort of a hallmark anyway? Yes, it is. I mean, in reading instruction and in math instruction, I mean, across across the disciplines, it's something that we do try to do a lot of. And people call it in, in education, multimodal presentation of, mm. of concepts. Um, it, it's, I mean, a, a sort of corollary to that and to the, the answer that you've just offered us, which was helpful, is, you know, is there something special about, I mean, one of the things that occurred to all of us is that so much of what we're, we do in school, at least, so much learning that happens in school relates to language and specifically to reading. And is there a special way that that, uh, that, that models built through language are different from models built through physical interaction? Well, I can only, I'm not a linguist and I don't really know the field very well, um, but I know a little bit about it, but not, no, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a linguist. Um, but I think um, I did point out in the book um, that there is something different about language and, and learning through language. And I think it's worth pointing out. If, if you and I, if all of us were presented with a new object that we'd never saw before, a physical thing, and say we'd never seen a stapler before and we were all given one and we'd, we'd all, we would all hold it and move it and look at it independently. We'd all build a similar kind of model of it because we there's the model would be self-correcting. And you know, if, if I if I thought maybe it didn't move and then I discovered it moves, like oh, it does move. I didn't realize that. Mm. Uh, and so we'd all end up with a, a similar um, model in our head. When we learn through language, we're not actually we're relying on other people. Language, um, it's 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 we're learning about something without without really personally interacting with it. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you read, if I read about the history of, of China and you, and you read a different history of China and it was written by different people, we'd come up with different conclusions about it, right? We, how would we know? We have no way of checking it unless we go to China and experience these things, or, you know? So when we learn through language, which is what's really the hallmark of humans, because we, we know so much that we don't personally experience um, and we have to learn that through language, uh, it's very easy for us to form different beliefs about the world and different models about the world. Yeah. And so it's, it's a process and we don't have an easy way of, of noticing that they're wrong. <laughs> um, and so um, it, it, this is why we have a lot of false beliefs in the world or a lot of different beliefs in the world is because you just people are exposed to different, um, different presentations of um, through language. So it, it is it is different and we rely on so much as humans, but it's really different in the sense that it's not really self correcting as easily as other things, you know. When we physically touch something, so it's prone for errors. Uh, it's very, and that's what propaganda is, etc. It, it's sort of struck us that that there's a kind of that, that nested reference frame sort of thing going on, where I, maybe I have a frame for the word democracy or the concept democracy, and you have one, and in that is you know within that is nested a whole series of other concepts that build up democracy. And by the time we get to the end, the two of us may have diverged a lot and still be using the same words, maybe even the same sentence. Yeah, yeah, and and actually having different meaning for it in our heads. I, th I think we see that a lot in the world. Um, is there anything along those lines that, that you know is different in terms of how, I mean, the section on heavy learning is, is what made us think about this. So is there anything <laughs> technically, you know, physically different about how uh, memories are encoded, models are encoded, when they're when they the data comes in different ways, whether it's through reading or through the authority of, of the, the your parent telling you about the stove being hot rather than touching it, then if I go through the the other uh, more direct sensory way, um, well, a couple of things it's at the, some substrate level of the neurons and so on. We don't have any evidence that it's different. Um, that is the, the neural tissue that stores these different types of knowledge seem very similar um, and. So, but I think there, what learning is a very complex process and um, a lot of it has to do with our emotional states. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so when you bring up different scenarios like, well, what your parents tell you, what your friends tell you, what you learn on your own or what you read in the book, um, now we're entering regions where, um, which is the stuff we don't study very well, but you can think of, you can think of the, the, the part of the brain we study, the neocortex, is this building this general purpose model, but what it decides to learn and how long it remembers something is very much dependent on the, the contextual space at which it occurred and the emotional space. If you're with someone and you just fell in love and they just told you something, 
um, that you might remember that forever <laughs> this is a, because of your emotional state at that point in time. Um, and you might, you know, if your parents are telling you something and you just had an argument with him, you might not, you might not even listen to it. <laughs> it just goes in one ear out the other. Maybe so it's for us, because we, we tend not to hope that teachers and students fall in love in, in most situations, but, but certainly there's an emotional or well, I was, I didn't say about your teacher. I oh, said, no, right. I said, you, I said, you fell in love. I didn't say you said about your teacher, you know, right. you know, I fell in love with my wife and she started telling me things. I listened to her and I'm like, oh, that's wonderful. I'm going to remember that. So. Maybe, maybe that's a good spot to, to ask if these guys want to jump in with a, a question or a comment. Um, yeah, one thing I had to say was going back to like how we like build up like these more complex thoughts. Is it kind of like we're correlating them back to like more like concrete objects that we can actually like have those like 3D models of to basically like compare and contrast them to like build up higher level ideas and thoughts i mean like it's, yeah i think i think we do do that um it's helpful i don't think it's always required um you know you know it, it's like um to take take watson and crick the two guys who discovered the dna structure the dna molecule um they were working in this sort of very difficult uh, problem understanding how, what the shape of the molecule that encodes our genes and no one knew what it was, and it was very difficult. And they had it, and but they they physically made models. You might have seen pictures of, as you can find them of the two of them with these big models of the amino acids and so on. And they were they would physically hold these things together and try to fit them together, like to see if it worked, right? And that was a key part of how they made that discovery: is that they built physical structures of things that they couldn't see. And, and by holding them in their hand and looking at them, it helped them figure out what the ultimate uh, shape of the DNA molecule was. That is, I mean, as much as we can do that, it's useful. I'm not sure it's always doable. <laughs> you know, I don't know what kind of physical model I'd make for something like democracy. I, uh, it's an interesting question. Maybe you guys could figure that out. I mean, I, mean, I think if you could figure it out, it'd be really cool, you know? It'd be, or maybe there's some, maybe there's some general purpose um, physical things you could do that would just, help facilitate um, imagination and thinking about problems. Um, I mean, it's an interesting idea that, you know, what, what would be the equivalent of Watson Crick's, you know, models of molecules uh, when you're trying to learn about something conceptual? Um, I bet you it would help if you could come up with something. <laughs> anyway, that, I think your question, uh, Ranger, was, you know, can we, can we relate our conceptual models back to physical things? I think that's what you're asking. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a really interesting idea. Um, and as I point out, we do do it anyway, to some extent. Uh, I know in my personal work, what I'll do is I will, I will make doodle sketches. I'm trying to figure out something and I'm stuck. And so I'll just draw pictures of it and, and try to make pictures of it. And sometimes I don't even know what the picture is supposed to look like, but I'll just start drawing pictures and say, well, it'll look like this. Maybe we rearrange it this way, it'll look like that. And sometimes that helps, you know? Um, that's an interesting question from a, from a teaching pedagogical point of view. Uh, how would you bring more physical structure into the learning process? Mm -hmm. um, that's an interesting question. I don't know. Range, what about your, your will question? Uh, Are you my, thinking about that? My, like the one we were talking about yesterday? Yeah. Um, so like in chapter nine, you kind of discuss like consciousness and stuff. Yeah. Um, and like, how like you can use it to, like or how you shouldn't be using it to like develop like machine like artificial intelligence and stuff um and how you're like pretty adamant about that is like but like you, you're kind of saying that there's no like amount of computing power that can develop like its own will and or, or its own like goals and intentions yeah that's yeah. right that's, that's separate from consciousness but yes um i i said i said building an intelligent machine doesn't necessarily mean it will be, it, it's going to develop its own wills and its own intentions and its own goals, yes. Yeah. yeah, but you kind of, um, then my question is like, with like kind of the steady rate of our progress with kind of like our technological like computing power, do you not think it's like inevitable that we'll have like so much computing processing power that it will, will be able to render those type of things? Well, no, I, I, I think it can, I, I'm, um, uh, maybe clear about it, Ranger. The the, the um, I have no doubt that we can build computers that are powerful enough to, you know, model 
be really super intelligent and so on. The argument was more of a fundamental question, not about computing power. Um, if I build an intelligent machine, does that, even if it's super intelligent, even if it's like a huge model of the world and thinks a million times faster than you and I do, um, will that on its own make, it'll just one day say, hey, I'm alive and I don't wanna be constrained by you and I wanna be free and I, you know, I like eating chocolate milkshakes or something like that. You know, my point is it, it, that doesn't happen on its own. And many people think it will. Many people think that when you build something, an intelligent machine, it will some sense uh, have the same motivations and drives that humans do. Um, but those don't come from the intelligent part of the brain. They come from the, uh, the other parts of the brain. And, and, and just because you build an intelligent machine, even a really super sophisticated one doesn't mean it's, it will, in fact, it won't. And my argument is it won't uh, all of a sudden wake up and say, well, why am I a slave to this human type of thing? You know, um, that you can separate out intelligence from these emotional states and drives and emotions that we as, as, as um, biological beings have. Um, so, uh, but it's not a computing power um, argument. Um, it's more just like you can separate these two functions out. And so people who worry about intelligent machines um, conflate the two things. They say, yeah, when you're smart, you're gonna wanna be like a human. And I'm saying, no, you can be smart and not like a human at all. And you won't, you could be smart and not care about anything that humans care about um, because you can just know about the world and know how to do things and, and not really care about um, the kind of things that humans are occupied with as emotional creatures you know, with a biological heritage. Well, like if there's like a point where it gets like super intelligent, what do you kind of like consider as like how we consider like farm animals? Like where you kind of they're at our disposal type of thing even though uh, I, I you maybe i guess so i don't know i mean because farm animals actually are emotional animals too so i think i think it'd be more like a computer right you can you know i don't feel bad turning off my computer <laughs> you know it doesn't feel bad either um it you know even if the computer was super smart it wouldn't care um uh it, it's more like that. Um, farm animals are, are, you know, of course, they're really, they're most, a lot of them are mammals just like us. And so uh, not all of them, but some are. Um, but in some sense, you're right. Yeah, you could, you could argue that. Uh, but some people think it's, it's um, some people argue that it's, uh, you know, it's ethically improper to, that, we, that we kill farm animals. I, I'm not taking a stand on that. Um, but I don't think anyone could say it's ethically um, problematic if we turn off our computer. <laughs> we do it every day. So, you hear that argument about the, the Wi-Fi in the evenings from students. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, that sort of sort of pushes me toward another question I have, which is about attention. Um, I mean, is the I, mean, I don't know whether will and attention are closely enough related to talk about them together, but but is our attention guided completely by other parts of the brain, and is the neocortex, you know? The, the the worker to the to the intention center uh, attention centers or yeah um, okay well attention in our world you have to be careful about language here so when I use the word attention I'm talking about a physical phenomena that happens in the brain where um, uh, let's just talk about visual attention you might be say okay Michael you're, you're teaching a class and you say okay everyone I want you to pay you know attention to what I'm writing on the board. And while you're doing that, someone opens the door on the side of the room and everybody's head's gonna to turn to that open door. Regardless of what you said, doesn't matter. <laughs> Even if they're trying really hard to not be distracted, the door opens, everyone's gonna go, what? <laughs> what happened? Um, and that's a physical phenomenon. And now the tension, so what happens is your brain was literally pointing its sensors at one thing. And now that's gonna point its sensors at something else. And it was thinking about one thing and now it's gonna think about the other thing. And that process can happen in both a top down and bottoms up. The example I just gave was a bottoms up example, right? Everyone's constantly saying, oh, hey, I'm gonna to listen to the professor, you know, Michael, he's telling us to not take our attention off the board. I'm thinking about that, that's a top down attention. And then bingo, the door opens and that's a bottom up thing. That's like the old brain saying, whoa, something's moving over there, better look at it, might be dangerous. Um, and so what we attend to is a combination of things of both uncontrolled older brain type of functions and um, uh, top-down um, conscious attention. Uh, but it's a physical process. It's not a mysterious thing. 
it's really the brain is literally moving its sensors. It, there's something going on in the cortex with, uh, where it essentially narrows down the input from some area of the sensory arrays that you have. Um, and it says, we're gonna process that thing right now because that's more important at this moment in time. Uh, and I separate that from any kind of concept of, you know, free will or um, something like that. The troubling, the troubling thing about those explanations, I think that sort of nagged at us at several places as we read the book, is that it, it, maybe, maybe we're overdoing it, but it seemed to, to kind of suggest a, a really, um, you know, almost Laplacian determinism. Like these are just molecules interacting and that's the end of it. There's no directing your attention as if there's an effort of will in there somewhere. There's no, uh, you know, your taste is determined somehow yeah. from, from those thoughts. Well, you know, that's, there's a sort of underlying theme to the book and I, I call it out at a couple of places. I call it out early on in the book where I say, every thought you have is the activity of neurons and the activity of neurons are your thoughts and there's nothing else. Now, I didn't bring open the big can of worms about free will, with, but that's what I was talking about there. Um, I'm of the belief, uh, as is most neuroscientists, uh, not all, but most, uh, that there isn't something independent of the physical brain. Uh, that is, you don't have a mind and a brain that are separate. There is no free will. That is a will that's independent of the biological uh, tissue. Um, many people, maybe yourself, I don't know, have trouble believing that or don't want to believe that. Uh, but uh, there seems to be no evidence to suggest it's different. Um, and it doesn't really take away my view. It doesn't take away the beauty of the whole thing. It doesn't take away the beauty of, I think, of, of a human being. Um, and uh, what we're capable of doing and so on to, to say, yes, we're biological. That doesn't mean it's deterministic. That doesn't mean that anyone could say, oh, I can know your state you know, and if I know the state of your brain that I know everything you're gonna do in the future. Um, that's not true. We know that the world isn't deterministic like that. As far, it's, it fundamentally, physics tells us we can't predict the future, quantum mechanics and some other things. Um, so it's not like, oh, there's no point in the world, <laughs> no point in doing anything. Uh, it's all determined. I don't believe that's true, but it's also true that there's no, indip I think, and maybe you'll disagree. I'd like to hear your opinion about it. Um, and whether, you know, there's no independent free will that's free from the biology. Well, yeah. I mean, in fact, that kind of touches on the topic here in that, you know, my question that I've been posing is, say, you know, these things about how your brain works then you could take specific actions. You know, you're limited to this amount of sensory input. So you say, I got to open my sensory input to other kinds of sensory input and open my vector. So I make sure I'm getting the information or challenge this information from here because now I understand how easy it is to just be kind of seduced into a narrow view. And that is, that is kind of free will and determinism of understanding you know, how you learn in order to broaden how but, you But to say you're understanding, it's still your brain that's understanding it. It's not yeah, it's like- still your brain. No, it's, it's not, not like, there's a little, brain, little Don right? up here talking to the brain saying, you know, yeah. you ought to do this, you ought to do that, you know? Yeah, you are your brain. You are you your brain. You are your brain. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird, I know it's weird being human, isn't it? It's like, you know, <laughs> we, we have, uh, you know, we're these biological machines that are really complicated and we have these internal thoughts and we have these internal emotions um, and, um, and it makes us feel like, um, there's lots of reasons we feel like, there's a lot of reasons we might feel like we're independent of our brain, but we can observe ourselves and we can, as uh, you just described Donna, we can observe our own things and say, hey, maybe I should do this or do that. Um, it's very easy to fall into the, the language of dualism, which is like speaking of myself as independent of my brain. Yeah, we all do it. <laughs> it's one of the worries I had when I got to the end of the book in, with your recommendation about let's let's make sure that students understand these things about their brain. There should be a sort of course in here's here's my equipment. <laughs> you know, here's yeah, <laughs> you it's how to use it. <laughs> we, we have a little bit of, of interesting experience here with that because students uh, at Eagle Hill are you know, typically come to us having been told that they have what, what I'll call so-called learning disabilities. I don't know if we really want to get into the so-called right now, but let, let's just, they've been told that at some point, and it, it's pretty clear in our experience that they are more likely to say, after having had those conversations for many years with uh, evaluators, neuropsychologists who do evaluations with them, and, and parents and teachers, they're very likely to say things in, in a classroom setting like, sorry, it's not me, it's just my brain. <laughs> and they kind of create this dualism that resulted from hearing about some 
uh, I very often structure, my brain isn't, the, the phrase is often, my brain's not wired like that, I'm not wired for math, et cetera. And it, 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 it's a very fatalistic point of view. It's a tough thing to overcome in an educational setting. And it, it's, got, do you have advice about how to avoid that? When I don't, you know, I think, I think there are clearly differences in everybody's brains and what we're good at and what we're not good at. You know, everyone's good at some things. And, you know, it's funny, I, I, my wife is, does a lot of art and she sees colors I can't see. I just can't see them. I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> and, and then I'll talk about things and she'll go, what the hell are you talking about? You know, it's like, and so we're experiencing the world the same. So my main point is there's a spectrum on which we all, we all have differences. And I mean, you know, our work has been trying to understand the basic commonality of how brains work and not like the differences. But I think ultimately we'll have theories about that. Why do some people learn dif differently in this way or that way? What's the right method for, for teaching? So there may not be a single method that works best for everybody on all different topics. And clearly some people are better at language than other people. Uh, some people are better at art than other people. Some people, you know, just this music than other people. Um, and I think some of that is, is trained and learned in, in your lifetime, but some of it's probably inherent too. Um, so um, we don't have to put a label on it as good or bad. It's just we're, we're all a little bit different. Um, can I uh, can I turn this question to Ranger and Jacob? I'd be interested in uh, I, were there any specific moments or places in the book where you went like an aha moment where you said, "Oh, this helps me understand something I do or some way I learn." Like for me, it's the cupcake with the old brain versus the new brain. It's like. Oh yeah, I relate to the cupcake story. You relate to that one, huh? I, I totally relate to that one every day. Uh, but you know, I, I guess I'm just curious from your point of view, Jacob and Ranger, how, how whether there were moments like that that struck you as aha moments. Yeah. So, well, you talked a lot about in your book about how memories are created, and after reading this, I was very interested, and um, I I thought about how how memories can be retrieved because after after reading this I, it took me a minute to understand exactly how it worked but then i had the question for example if like how does someone remember the name of their childhood pet after a number of years what exactly triggers that 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 thing in your brain to to retrieve that back to you so that was a question that i had that i was kind of interested about and hearing your opinion on Hmm, that's a good question. Well, um, in the book, I described the basics by how knowledge is stored in reference frames and so, you know, and in order to retrieve a piece of information, like the name of a friend or something like that, you have to, you have to, in some sense, the neurons have to invoke that location in the reference frame. And, and you do that by, it's analogous to movement, but you, you can't get there randomly from everywhere. It's like, it's like if I want to, um, if I want to recall where something is in my house, I still have to mentally move through the house to get there, and then I recall it's there. And the same basic process would be occurring um, um, in in terms of your friend. So it all has to be in context. I mean, it, we don't really have random thoughts, right? So, uh, but you'd have to you have to follow some series of links to get you to that point. In the sense, in some sense, of following the same series of links walking through your house to figure out what's in the drawer in the kitchen. Um, and so, you know, we don't have these thoughts don't just literally pop into our head. There's always some, some context to which there was something related to that item that was like, oh yeah, if I just, and now if I follow a set of links, so I can get to that item and it, and it appears. But beyond that, I can't really answer that too well. Um, I can say that some memories are very permanent, uh, Jacob. So, um, and, and we can talk about why that is. Why, why do you remember your, you know, something happened early in life and, and you can't remember things that happened more recently. Uh, that's pretty easy to explain, you know, but but there's sort of uh, these links to get to how you retrieve something. There's always there's always some chain of chain of thought that gets you there. It can happen very quickly too. It doesn't have to be the, the flow process, but you know you could think about you know someone you see now reminds you of a place you were, and that place reminds you of another place you were, and that place reminds you of where the friend was there, and and that can happen very very rapidly. And all of a sudden, oh yeah, that was my friend you know, Susan. I haven't seen her in a while. I think it has interesting implications for the pedagogy. I'm curious what you think about this, Michael, and that if, if you people are struggling to remember things as they're trying to learn things, the idea of having 
you know, de- putting in deliberate links to learn them with other things that they relate to and helping mm. them along the way might really uh, enable that. I mean, it's kind of like the, the memory, uh, the memory, memory tools, palace, the memory, memory palace tools yeah. and so on. But, you know, I'm just struck by, you know, if I asked you what's the letter before H in the alphabet, you might not be able to say it unless you kind of walk through the alphabet and then you can, <laughs> you can give the left. Right? Yeah. yeah. Teachers do use a range of mnemonic devices like the memory palace or, or others, you know, where there are associations made where, you know, the, people make up acronyms for things that help them recall. I mean, it, it, a lot is, is dependent upon subject matter and frankly, and individuals that are, that are working at remembering something. Um, so, so yeah, I think, it's, I think it's an important thing for us to think about. Memory is a, a huge question for us in, in education, obviously. I mean, it, it's a constant uh, question for, for students and teachers about how is it that it appeared that you, know, this, you, you had a solid memory of this last Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and now Monday, it seems to have evaporated altogether. Uh, yeah. And, 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 yeah. and you know, there, it, it's useful to know some of the things that will make those yeah, that, that's a that's a field of study that uh, I didn't talk about in the book, but that's a situation which it's not how the memory is stored, but how permanent it is. And um, maybe you know about this, maybe perhaps more than I do, Michael. But there's there's various chemicals like dopamine that are involved in <clears throat> releasing in your brain, um, like a reward system that that essentially make synapses form, connections form, and the connections in the brain they come and go rapidly, these connections between the neurons. Um, on any particular neuron in the neocortex, you might see 40%, 40% of, of the thousands of connections on that cell change every day. That is, some go disappear, new ones appear. Some stay around forever. Some connections stay for the rest of your life. Other ones are just, you know, work for a couple of weeks and now it's gone. That, those issues, like uh, why would I remember something for a week and then forget it? It's a little bit outside of our realm of, of, of knowledge. It has to do more with the sort of the biochemistry of the synapses and why they form and unform. Uh, we, we, we focus more on how the information is structured in the brain, like what is it, what's its manifestation? Yeah. But, um, but you know, why one, you know, what, what leads these synapses to, why would I forget something or learn something? There has to, there's a whole field of literature about how to motivate people um, you know, what kind of motivation and gamification and so on that works to do that. But I don't really know that field very well. Well, one quirky way we thought about this for a couple of days was whether it is possible intentionally to forget something. And I mean, we got sort of all twisted up thinking about it, but- That's interesting. <laughs> what did you decide? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, our tiny thought experiments were not very successful. Uh, we didn't, you know, I think we remember trying to forget the thing, but not, you know, I, I don't think we managed, of course, maybe I wouldn't know if we had been successful. I don't know. <laughs> like every, every, time, every time you think about forgetting it, you're remembering it, right? right. So it's a, yeah, uh, which makes it, and, and the weird thing about forgetting stuff, we don't really, we don't know the things we've got, right? We just don't, like, how can you know that? Right, I mean, success yeah. might just not be evident. Right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, always, I always use this little example about forgetting. It's just like, you know, if I asked you what you had for breakfast this morning, you could tell me that, no problem. And, um, and I said, what'd you do last night? You say, I think, well, I, mean, I can think of that. But I asked you what you had for breakfast just a week ago on a Tuesday, you say, I don't know. <laughs> but you did know it, you know, yeah. there was a time you knew it and the connections were there and it was there. And so your brain is just constantly forgetting stuff. Everything you're doing all day long, it's just constantly forgetting. You, you remember all these facts from today or yesterday and they're gone in the week. Um, so this is inherent to the problem of, uh, you know, there's an interesting, there's another field of, uh, of interesting fact, again, unrelated to our research, but a very, very interesting fact is that when you recall something like you recall a memory, uh, what happens is, is, again, you're recalling these connections between neurons. That, that's the basis of the memory. But uh, in many situations, um, the actual fact of recalling erases the memory and writes it again. Meaning it, it, the, the connections are lost and then they're reformed very quickly. And, and, and what this has been proven to show is that when you actually recall something, you can enter is it an opportunity to to um, to make the new the new version of the memory incorrect, mm. and so this they've used this for therapies for people who are they're trying to get people to 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 not be fearful about something for example, 
or they're trying to get people to forget things or they're trying to get people to you know change people's memories so there's a lot of false memories that can be formed but because when you recall something it gets formed again and if you mess with that process it it, it can really screw things up so just the fact of recalling something gives you the opportunity of, of at least messing up the memory, if <laughs> not forgetting it. So um, you guys should tell your math teachers that when you made a mistake on a formula, it's really because they went over it too many times. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's in some sense. It's like that a little bit, isn't it? Isn't that odd? Uh, <laughs> I do find that personally too. I don't know if you, if you guys feel that way, but sometimes you just think about something too hard. It just doesn't settle in. It doesn't settle in. You just can't do it. And you come back the next day and you try again and it works, you know. One of the things that, that jumped out to me that I'm, I'm curious what, what you all thought of this, Michael and, and Ranger and Jacob, is um, you give an example, Jeff, about um, how you can arrange facts in different reference frames, right? And how yeah. that can lead to different conclusions. And I think you give the example of you could arrange facts in a, in a timeline, for example, yeah. or you could arrange them geographically, and that would lead yeah. to different conclusions. And doesn't that also mean it can lead to different levels of understanding? So maybe in the timeline version, I, I have a surface level understanding of it, but when you put it on a, on a map, maybe then I really understand it. And this notion of kind of finding different reference frames leading to just different different conclusions to me suggested that would lead to different levels of understanding. Well, I don't know the levels is right because that's assuming that you know this is the right reference frame. Well, right? okay. Right but, I, but I'm thinking about- You'd end up with different beliefs. You'd end up with different beliefs. Right. right. But when you have okay. things like, like, like math concepts where suddenly you get it, is that because you finally were able to have things in, in a reference frame that worked for you to understand? Yeah, yeah I, I, I did use that example in the book about mathematics is that for many people, a great many people, they look at mathematical formulas and, and numbers and it just looks like Greek. Um, mm -hmm. And they don't, it, it's not, it, it just, you're struggling with it, right? It's like looking at a foreign language you don't read and you're trying to yeah. make sense of it. Um, but for a mathematician, they 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 love numbers and they they're like friends and they know what their relationship to each other. And so they look at an equation and they know immediately what it is. It's 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 the same as them looking at a at a stapler and go, oh, I know what that is and I know what I can do with that. And and but it's because in the argument I make in the book is that because they've developed reference frames for mathematical concepts, which is a weird thing to think about, but they've done that, and um, and then then these things become very familiar. So I think not having a good reference frame is certainly a detriment if you're trying to understand a field. But you know, whether if you think about history in terms of timelines or spatial area, I don't know which is better. I don't know if there is a better one or not. You know? Well, I think one of the interesting questions for Eagle Hill, because this is what they specialize in, is it, it may not even be better or worse. It may be that different reference frames are better for different people. So they have mm. focused a lot on, you know, we teach the way you learn. And I know, you know, people have different learning styles. And we said everybody's brain is a little bit different. So it, it could be certain reference frames are better for developing a deeper understanding than others for different people, right? That's a good point. I mean, when you teach math, do you do, you do that already? I mean, do you, do you try to come up with like physical analogies for the mathematics? I don't know. We do. And I think Donna's exactly right that it, it, it's not so much which is the right reference frame, but which is the, the most effective one today for the goals we have with this person at 10 o'clock in the morning in music. You know, I mean, it, yeah. it may shift between today and tomorrow based on something else. But even what, one of the questions we have about reference frames, somewhere in, relatively early in the book, I think you say, you know, the difficult thing is choosing or developing the right reference frame for something. Yeah. And that, that makes it sound like a sort of intentional process is there is there a way we can be more intentional about it? i think you know i think you're honing in on maybe the the core thing that we can get out of today's conversation um and i and not i'm, I'm just i'm observing this um as opposed to coming in with this as a point of view um yeah i meant that because the reason i wrote those words is because i felt that we weren't even aware that we we're doing this reference frame creation it's 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 not even in the language of learning at least i'm both familiar with it and um and yet it's the core requirement to learn right and so we we're presented with facts and we present them over and over again and we're just somehow hoping that the brain figures out the right way to organize them <laughs> you know? well, and so i think maybe the the fundamental thing we could maybe walk away from this is perhaps we could develop a science about this 
a science about even testing different ways of teaching different types of uh, reference frames. In, in, uh, in our work, for example, I'll give you an example. In our work, we spend a lot of time talking about very high dimensional spaces, a bit like a space with not three dimensions, but a thousand dimensions. And it's totally not intuitive at first, um, but after a while you get kind of used to it, you know, and, uh, and then you can start thinking about it like that. Um, I'm just pointing out that that's, there's so much in the world to, to, to be an expert in something, you need to have that correct structure. And maybe there are ways we could figure out how to teach where it encourages that structure. I'm, I'm thinking ideas in my head right now because the, the, way, the, the way we learn the structure of, of the, the reference frames for physical objects in the world is we, the way the brain does this, and I haven't written about this yet, but it's in my next paper, is the brain observes uh, it actually observes how your body moves. And, and from those observations, it determines what is the, the, the space that it's moving in. And, and so you can literally, it literally observes your finger moving left and right, or your eyes, it observes things moving around. And, and so the point, well, I'm, I'm sort of rambling here, but the, the idea is that we might be able to come up with a structured way involving uh, clever, clever tricks in some sense that uh, force uh, the brain to, to define a, a useful structure for knowledge. So if we're trying to teach a new concept like mathematics, um, maybe there is, um, uh, in the future, we'll develop a, a, a sort of a clever techniques for, for just blasting the brain with some certain information that forces it to think in certain structures. <laughs> I, I can't express it better than that. But it's a very interesting idea to me that that, that that whole thing of reference frames and just acknowledging we have to come up with, you know, structure to represent this knowledge and what, what should we do physically to make sure that the body is doing that. You're already doing that with physical, you know, manipulation of things, but maybe we could do something more clever than that. Um, you know, I know I, it's a very interesting idea. It's very fuzzy at the moment. And, but I think that's the kind of that's the kind of thing that we could we could look forward to. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have one more sort of set of questions, um, at least that occurred to me right now, and that's about whether you think uh, the prevailing sort of models of cognition, uh, you know, the, the kinds of things that neuropsychologists use as constructs when they're thinking about individuals short-term memory, fluid reasoning, working memory, processing speed, those kinds of things. Will what you're learning ask us to adopt a, a different way of, of, a different set of constructs along those lines? Um, perhaps, it's an interesting question. I mean, if, if, if I just put a blanket term like psychologists, right? Um, you know, that's a field where psychologists come up with different terms for different things for the same things, right? Some of them say, oh, there's six properties of this. And then one says, no, there's four properties of this. And, and, uh, and they're kind of made up, you know, they're, <laughs> they're not necessarily empirically grounded. Um, and so I, that doesn't mean they're not useful. Uh, it doesn't mean they're not great. It just means that, well, it's somewhat arbitrary how you design, you know, what, how I did some types of learning. You know, someone might say there's three types and someone there's six types, who knows? Oops, that was your buzzer. Um, and then, um, so I think what we can hope for is with a real grounding in neuroscience, we can say these are the physical properties that are underlying learning. So we can call them different names if you want, but these, we all have to agree that these are the, you know, the physical, there's maybe six of them or whatever, or two, three of them. These are the actual physical properties. And, you know, we can call them whatever you want to call them, but it's not arbitrary. Um, and I think that is, is something you can think about pedagogy, you can think about psychology, you can think about even a lot of um, uh, psychiatric disorders are things we deal with every day, but aren't really, they don't have a foundational science behind them. They don't have like, you know, this base theory, they don't have the atomic theory of of you know brain function. <laughs> well, they have a they have a behavioral science behind them as opposed to a neuroscience. Yeah, but but again, my, my point is that the behavioral science is again not. I keep going on. I want to get down to the substrate, right? They don't right. go down to like okay, this is what's going on with the cells in your head, the neurons and the synapses, because that's why I said it's like an atomic theory, right? You can have a theory of chemistry or you can have a theory of you know genetics, but at the bottom there's atoms. You know, and uh, and they all have to build up on that. 
And so um, I think today we have the equivalents of like, oh, we have genetic theories, we have this and this in, in, in this other space, but we don't really have the atomic component of it. And maybe that's the kind of the work we're trying to provide. It's like underlying all these different things are, is a physical manifestation, a physical substrate. And that's not questionable. We, well, you, we can understand it. And then everything has to be built on top of that. Did that answer your question, Michael? Yes, I, mean, I think that's a, a yes. We were, we we're hoping to get there someday. Yeah, I, I think it's, it, I've come to believe it's amazing. We, we, all, we all have to go through you know, 20, 30 years of learning, formal learning. And we don't have these really fundamental knowledge about what's going on in our heads as we learn. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's the dream, I guess, in some sense of, of our work is ultimately we'd have that foundational knowledge and we would be able to come up with these, these techniques that you've talked about um, where we could say, okay, now we know what we're doing concretely, not just, you know, at, at, at a fundamental level, why we should come up with this method of te teaching that would be effective for this person. Um, interesting. I, I think that's fascinating. I, I wish I had another lifetime to work on it. <laughs> well, I guess Ranger and Jacob are going to have to work on it. Yeah, you guys, so you, guys, you guys can do that. You guys can do that. I actually have yeah. one question, if that's okay. Sure. Um, can you explain just a little bit about why our perception of our own visual environment is stable? And um, also, on the process of neuron voting, um, I didn't quite understand it fully, but it interests me a lot. And um, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So those are related, right? Those are the those are very related. Well, let's just start with the mystery, right? The mystery is your eyes are moving about three times a second. Uh, you're not aware of it, um, but it's really happening. And every time your eyes move, the input to the brain from the eyes changes completely. It's not like it's shifting. It's a completely new input. And for the most part, we are completely unaware this is happening. The world seems stable. <laughs> How can that be? Um, well. I can explain it at different levels. At one level, what you're perceiving is actually your model of the world. It's not the act, it's really the model of the world and your model of the world says it's stable. So that's why it's stable, but we can explain how it happens. Um, and I go through this in the book in some detail, but I'll try to review it here really quickly. It's not that it, it's each, it's, remember the neocortex is divided into these many, many of these columns and the columns are sophisticated. They're really complex processing elements. And each one's inputs to it is changing and it's trying to, it's trying to figure out what's going on in the world. Imagine you have a, 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 a column in your neocortex that's looking at a little part, it's getting a little part of your visual input. It's not getting the whole input. It's just getting, it's like it's looking through a straw, right? And it only sees a little bit. Imagine you're looking through a straw and as you move the straw around, the input, what you see through the end of the straw is changing, but you might say, oh, that's a chair. Even though you're moving your eyes around, it's a chair. So the, the, the column is saying, I got these changing inputs, but I'm, I'm correlating the movement with the input and I'm gonna figure out what's out there to chair. And, but the, the idea that the chair is not changing. Um, now, when you put a whole bunch of columns together, you don't have to move them. I mean, because each one is look, looking through a straw and they just, they just say to each other, okay, I'm seeing this and I'm seeing this and I'm seeing this and I'm seeing it. What is the one thing that we can all agree on that this is? And, it, and that's the voting. And, and they send these connections between them and they say, okay, we all agree this has to be a chair. And so the, the neurons that are actually, actually firing that represent chair, those neurons are gonna say, this is a chair. Those neurons are stable. They're not changing. Where the inputs to all the columns are changing rapidly. So you have one set of neurons that are just saying, this is a chair and all the other neurons are going part of a chair, part of a chair, moving around, blah, blah, blah. And um, it turns out we're only consciously aware of the vote. So the other stuff we have, we can't, it's happening in your brain, but you can't access it. You can't talk about it. it it's stuck in these columns. Like, it doesn't move beyond the columns. The only thing that moves beyond individual columns is these votes and the voting neurons are saying it's a chair. So that's what you perceive, the stable chair. Um, all the, all, most of the neurons are going, whoa, it's going this way, that way, this way, that way, it's changing all the time. <laughs> They're all still thinking like, I'm looking at this part of the chair, I'm looking at that part of the chair, I'm looking at this part of the chair. And so that's, that's the, how that mystery is solved is that you, you, you're only able to see the subset of neurons that are voting and they're all saying, it's the same chair. I don't care which way you're pointing, it's the same chair. Yeah. Um, and um, it's, a, it's pretty amazing that this is all happening in your head. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool, thank you. I know we've we've gone over. I'm I'm sensitive the, of the time here, but we've gone over your class time, Michael. So, uh, uh oh, are you in trouble? <laughs> don't want to get anyone in trouble here. <laughs> yeah, but I think they're okay with it. 
Uh, these are all great questions. I mean, they're really, really, really super questions you guys are asking. Yeah. I, I wish any, I knew. Any final, any final comments or questions that uh, we want to touch on before we wrap up? I mean, I'm really curious, Michael, if in the end, of the, if the end of the day, you have any big takeaway about whether this information is useful for people to even understand some of the basics in terms of their learning and their different learning styles, or is it just too? Is it premature? It's like, okay, we need another layer before we can actually get there, or what? What do you think? I think for us to make decisions about pedagogy, we need another layer. Uh, I think to get started coming up with the questions to ask about that, we have enough. And I think, you know, sitting with teachers and students, you know, reading, you know, getting a reading group together here that 12 of us sit and read the book and talk about it and then go back to class, you know, students and teachers and say, okay, what, you know, what do you see differently now? I think could be a useful mm -hmm. exercise. I, I don't have a, I don't have a takeaway about what that will reveal. I mean, we had a few ideas. I mean, I, I think I mentioned the one that leaves me a little concerned about the, you know, endorsing this sort of new dualism between my brain and me. Uh, and I think we have to be just careful about how we, how we convey that information, how we talk about the brain. And I mean, several places in the book, Jeff, you say, you are your brain. I think that's a helpful way to put it because it's so easy to slip into, well, my brain is just another thing that I somehow relate to and that is problematic. Yeah. Um, but but I think I think there's a good chance for that, you know, at least to start asking questions that would be interesting to, to follow. I think it's, that's a good summary, and it's helpful for me to hear you say that, Michael. I mean, again, I can relate to another field of science. It might be something. Let's go back to the you know discovery of uh, the DNA molecule and the biochemistry of life. Well, it took a long time before we had our messenger RNA uh, vaccine that that we're getting here. Um, you know, Pfizer and and, uh, and Moderna. Uh, but those kind of you know, there's a, there's a long gap both time and scientifically to fill in those extra layers between, hey, this is how our genes work to, hey, let's make a vaccine that solves, you know, solves the COVID. Yeah. Um, and you know, we have to fill in those gaps. But I think, you know, those gaps can be filled in rapidly. I, I think, you know, it's, well, rapidly, years, maybe a decade or so, um, maybe two decades max, I would say. Uh, it's possible we could we can fill those in and i think you know in the lifetime of you ranger and jacob these are things that are going to happen and you could help make it make happen uh, if you're so interested but it's not something that we're i, I think it's 100 years away or 50 years away i, I don't think so well, well this has been a great conversation for me i i have got some food to thought about this those you know how we design those missing layers you talked about um michael and donna um, I think the idea of thinking, I'm just re reiterating for my own benefit, the idea of thinking about what kind of ways could we actually uh, come up with for making a science out of reference frames and how to model, how to get people to think. And I know enough about them now that I might be able to come up with some ideas along that line. And um, so that's, to me, that was very beneficial. Great. Uh, I, it was great for us to, to have all of you on the other end of our conversations. <laughs>